Okay, Baruch Hashem, it's not flashing anymore, so we're good. Welcome. This is the Parsha in my life class. And tonight is a very holy night. Tonight, we just concluded the 14th day of Tammuz, and we're welcoming in the 15th day of Tammuz, which is the yard site, the day of the passing of the holy Ur HaChayim, Reb Chayim ben Atar. Tonight marks his 280th yard site. Um, he passed away in Tov Kuv Gimel in 1743. So 1843 and 1943, and now it's 2023. So we're 20 years away from 300. So 280 years since the passing of the Ur HaChayim. For that, we're going to first make a Lachayim. And I bought more than one cup. I bought actually four. So you have to bring more friends. There you go. It's a little bit of, I think, I think it's a bourbon, double oaked. Woodsford Reserve, I think it's a bourbon. Oh, straight bourbon. Whiskey. Chaim. <laughs> Let's hope this goes straight to the head so the shear works really well. Chaim. I'm not doing more than that. Yes. Have a little. Chaim may the holy neshama of Reb Chaim Ibn Atar. Uh, but his actually his name, I think, is Reb Chaim Ben Ramosha. May his um, merit stand by us, shine to us a lot of light and a lot of bracha. And most of all, the subject of tonight is going to be the Ur Chaim HaKadosh and Moshiach. Because the Ur Chaim was a spark of, Mesh of Mashiach's neshama. Orachayim um, is a great Sephardic, Kabbalist, Tzaddik, great scholar, Torah sage. He was born in Morocco. At a certain point in his life, he made his way up to the land of Israel. And he lived in the same time of the holy Baal Shem Tov. Now, his book is filled, is his Pirush, he wrote a Pirush, a commentary on the Chumash. If he wrote it himself or it was written from his teachings. Um, it was his teachings that he would teach his daughters. The Urachaim didn't have any sons. He only had daughters. And in general, since he was related to Mashiach, um, he already exhibits all the characteristics of the flipped over world of the days of Mashiach, as we shall soon see from his teachings. Um, and including the idea that he raised up the feminine. He raised up the, the women. He taught his woman, his, his daughter's Torah. And thank God for him teaching his daughter's Torah. That's how we have the Pirush of the Arachayim. And again, when I say he taught his daughter's Torah, in those days, very few people taught girls' Torah. Today's days, women study Torah, but and they should study Torah. And they should even outdo the men in studying Torah, as they will in the days of Mashiach. But um, in those days, it was still very uncommon. Those who followed mysticism were more lenient and more involved in teaching girls Torah. The Hasidim definitely, uh, at least amongst the Chabad Hasidis and so on and so forth, it was more common. The Alter Rebbe, the family of the Alter Rebbe, of the girls in the Alter Rebbe's family, Rishner Zalman of Liadi, were very knowledgeable in Torah. There's a lot of stories about it. Anyways, the Arachayim, I also read, interesting, that his wife, the Arachayim's holy Rebbetzin, would wear tefillin. I had, a, I had a grandmother who would wear tzitzis. His wife would wear tefillin. She's buried side by side next to him. Talking about the Urachaim's burial, he, he's, he's, he's buried in Mount Olives. 
in Harazesim. Because he went up and he strived very much to come to Jerusalem. All because he was a Messiah, he was a, he's a, he was a Mashiach soul. He had a spark of Mashiach in his soul. He even hints to in his book that he is Mashiach, which means he had a, a part of Mashiach's neshama. That's why the Holy Bolshemta was fascinated with him and the Bolshemta wanted to connect with him. But let's take one story at a time. Uh, before 1967, during the time when uh, Jerusalem was split and East Jerusalem was in the hands of the Jordanians, they, the Jordanians came around and they decided that they're going to eradicate all connections of Jews to the land of Israel, to Jerusalem. One of the things they did was they were running tractors across the holy burial site of Mount Olives to uproot the 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 kvar. Now you had um, old 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 the oldest cemetery going back to the times of the first temple, second temple, and they were managing. They were knocking down uh, uh, ohels. Ohels means like um, small little uh, buildings, that, not buildings, the small little structures that are built on top of a Especially for saintly people, you bring you, you don't just put a a stone, a gravestone. You put a oh, they were knocking it down. As the tractor came, this the story. This story was told by the guard, an old Arab who was guarding, who had the keys to the cemetery there. It was, it was fenced, and he was guarding the Orachaim's caver because of the story. He says they 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 came with their tractor. Now they were able to knock down so many tzaddikim. They were able to uproot. When they came to Arachaim's um, burial site and his, they they got close, the tractor suddenly flipped, and the person that was, um, the person that was driving the tractor or was killed. So they managed to tow the to get the tractor back on its on its uh, thing, and then they put in another driver. And as the second driver came close again, the tractor flipped the second time. And the second guy was killed. And these people were such so stubborn that they went and they tried a third time. Now, how do I know they could try a third time? Because the grand great 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 grandfather Bilam also tried three times last week to curse the Jewish people. After three times, he kind of gave up. So the, the, the Arabs also, after three times, they gave up. The third guy was also turned over the tractor. It's amazing. Three times they tried the same miracle. And the Arachim basically was saying, don't mess with me. And they and the third guy was killed. And they realized that this is a holy place. And they, they, you know, they're just going to leave it alone. And this guy, this Arab, he took it up. He was watching. He was guarding the grave. So tonight, for instance, in, or in Jerusalem, it's already morning there. But I'm sure thousands of people are there. Generally, it's an area that's not... It's not, it's, you have to, it's a little, uh, it's not always the most pleasant place to go because you're going into the real, through the real um, um, Muslim quarters in, in the old city and going through certain areas that are not as, uh, that sometimes could be a little bit violent. So people go and go, you know, you have to go uh, be careful. Um, but tonight, there's thousands and thousands of people throughout the next 24 hours who go to his grave site, to Davin, because the miracles that happen over there are unbelievable. So the great and saintly of the Orachayim, I'll say a little bit more about his life before we will learn. He was so obsessed with Mashiach. And that is because when you are Mashiach, you're obsessed with Mashiach. Now, the truth is, we all have a spark of Mashiach in our soul. The more that spark is revealed, the more excited we are about Mashiach, but there are smaller sparks and there are bigger sparks. So the Arachayim is known to have been a spark of Mashiach. Actually, it says that he and the Baal Shem Tov together made up part of the Mashiach's soul. The Baal Shem Tov, now the Rebbe himself brings this, so this is not, this is not just a statement. The Rebbe himself, I heard today a recording where the Rebbe says this. Um, the Rebbe would speak about the, the Rebbe, you know, besides the Chabad Rabbeim and, and the Baal Shem Tov and so on and so forth, from the recent Tzadikim, the Rebbe didn't speak that much. Chabad was, you know, who, who, who was spoken of and who was not, but the Arachayim is one that is spoken of. 
And the Rebbe mentions that the our Rabbeim, the Chabad Rabbeim, every time they mention the Orachayim, they would add HaKadosh, which is the Holy One. We don't say that about many. We say that on the Shalah HaKadosh, the Ari HaKadosh, the Orachayim HaKadosh, the saintly one. The Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh, of course. So it says that the Baal Shem Tov had the Nefesh of David Amalek of of King of, of Mashiach. Sorry, had the nefesh of Mashiach. Or sometimes I think it's quoted the nefesh of David. And the Arachayim had the Ruach. We know that the soul has five names: Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chai, Yechida. So the, the in Mashiach's Neshama, there are these levels. The Balshamta was the nefesh of Mashiach. And the Arachayim was the Ruach of Mashiach. The spirit of Mashiach versus the, the animating soul of Mashiach. It says had the two come together, they would have together brought the Neshama of Mashiach. And they could have activated the Giyula. They could have activated the redemption. But it wasn't meant to be. One of the primary reasons that it says that the Baal Shem Tov was seeking to go up to the land of Israel was because he wanted to meet the Arachai. In a letter that he wrote to his brother-in-law, Reb Gershon of Kitov, or rather, Reb Gershon of Kitov writes to his brother-in-law. Reb Gershon of Kitov is the brother-in-law of the Baal Holy Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism. So in the letter that the Reb Chaim, the, the Baal Shem, the um, Reb Gershon of Kitov writes to the Baal Shem Tov, he writes to him, that you told me once to his brother-in-law, the Baal Shem Tov, you told me once that there was, that there is a great Chacham, there is a great wise man, a great Tzaddik from the west of Israel, which is where Morocco is, from the west, who came up to the land of Israel, who possesses the Neshama of Mashiach in him, but he himself doesn't know about it. And he's huge scholar both in the revealed part of the Torah and the esoteric mysticism of the Torah and he's also a big Baal he cries a lot things that the Baal Shem Tov said to his brother-in-law about so he said I inquired Reb Gershon of Kitov was the brother-in-law of the Baal Shem Tov did go to the land of Israel so Reb Gershon sends to his brother-in-law I inquired and I found who you're talking about I know who that you didn't tell me who his name is but now I found who this is, the Arachayim, and he sends it to his. So it says that the Baal Shem Tov tried to go to the land of Israel. Made a big effort, and he actually arrived all the way in Turkey. But on the way going, he was, he was faced with incredible, incredible obstacles. According to some of the stories, accounts that the Baal Shem Tov lost all of his, of his spiritual lights, all of his spiritual capability. Everything was taken away from him. He had to hold on, and even some place it says he had to hold on simply to the letters of the Aleph base. There was nothing left in his mind. They wiped his hard drive clean, so to speak. Nothing. Well, he couldn't remember even how to, how to pronounce words. All he could know was just Aleph base, Gimel, Gal, and he was holding on to the letters. Uh, also, the, the ship was, 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 was either taken by pirates or it was or it's crazy stories that happen. In the end, the Baal Shem Tov had to turn around uh, because he saw that in heaven they don't let him go. Also, it was at some kind of, they say, at the same time that Arachim already passed away. So let's go, let's look at the Arachim a little bit before we go back to this, is that the Arachim was born in 1696. In 1696, somewhere in Morocco. His father, Ramosha. He um, moved to the city called Sali, somewhere in Morocco. Again, I don't know if I'm not pronouncing these names right. I think it's the city called Sali. And he was there for a couple of years. And um, he had this tremendous, tremendous urge and something pushing him to go to the land of Israel. Now then, Israel was pretty desolate, you know, didn't have too many Jews living there. It was later, the main aliyahs began with the Hasidic movement, with the Lithuanian, with the Vilna Goyen. What happened is that 
according to the Arachayim, as we're going to read one of his one of his writings, the time of the redemption reached a certain. We came to a certain point of redemption in the year 1740, because the year 1740 was the year six uh, five thousand five five thousand five hundred to creation. So since it's the year five thousand five hundred to creation, the Arachayim says it's. It's the morning of Friday, of the cosmic Friday. It's the uh, time when Allah Sashachar, when the uh, when it's dawn, a Friday morning. Now Friday is the time for Mashiach, because Mashiach comes to prepare the world for Shabbos. So Friday morning is a very is a very ap appropriate time for Mashiach to come. So the Rechaim says that this is the most apropos time for the Geula to happen, for the redemption to happen. And he says that you can see that the world is going to start sparking with the lights of Mashiach. And as predicted, yeah, Hasidism came to the world, the teachings of Mashiach came to the world, and so on and so forth. Right at that time, that was the time that the Balshemtov revealed himself. Balshemtov revealed himself in, in the year 1733. So 1740 is when the Arachayim is predicting that it's the time of the redemption. So the Arachayim believed very much, and again, it's if the Baruch Haim believed so, it's it's without a question. Um, had our Rebbe not insisted on this, I would say that it's probably still the job to do this. But the Baruch Haim very much believed that all the Jews should go up to the land of Israel to help bring the Geula, to help bring the redemption. The Baruch Haim wrote, again, Reb Chaim wrote as follows. He was talking about, you know, he was the descendant of the of the of those who were driven out of Spain. Jews that lived in Spain before the Spanish expulsion in, in 1492. So he wrote, he wrote that the, the, the Jews that were living in Spain that lost all their fortune, they were very wealthy, many of them, and all their fortunes were confiscated and they couldn't take anything out. And they were driven out under the threat unless they convert. And with Messira Snafish, with great sacrifice, they left everything behind and took the wandering stick and wandered out into exile. And they made their way from places to place. They suffered tremendously. They were robbed. They were beaten. They were in many places captured and taken into slavery. There was horrible things that happened. And that's when you know his family, great great grandparents, made their way to Morocco. But the Rechaim wrote that 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 the, under the and in the Arab countries, the Rechaim talks about. He testifies about horrific suffering. That the Jews endured under the Muslims uh, again and again and again. They were beaten, they were robbed, they were executed. There was all kinds of horrible things that were going on. And the Arachim himself, um, he had a father-in-law that supported him. When his father-in-law passed, this was a wealthy man. When his father-in-law passed away, the government went and confiscated everything, including his house. And they robbed him of everything. They left him penniless. Not only that, again, according to one of the um, um, sto not stories or, or historical things that I read, uh, he was actually imprisoned as well. So he writes that the suffering that the Jews had back then and the continuous suffering that the Jewish people were enduring in Europe and in, and in, and in the and in the Middle East, in the, Ara in the Arabic countries, is all a sign from God that it's time to pack our bags and start coming back to the land of Israel. And although the Rechaim knew that going to the land of Israel is going to be fraught with tremendous amount of obstacles and difficulty and pain, as the sages tell us that one of the things that you can acquire with suffering only is the land of Israel. But he felt at least that suffering would be leading us to the redemption. It's different than the suffering that they had in the lands of exile, which are, you know, an exile suffering. This would be redemption suffering. So he left and he decided at that point after this, all this happened to him in Morocco, that he's going up to, the, to Israel. He traveled and he got to a town, a poor town in a poor town in Italy. And I forgot the name of the town. He writes it in, the, in his books. He writes which city it was. 
And uh, he settled over there for a while because he, he didn't want to go to Israel himself. His point of going up to the land of Israel was to hasten the redemption. And therefore, he wanted to bring with him an entire yeshiva and open up a study hall where Jews will learn Torah and come and evoke and, and uh, bring back a presence of Jews to the land of Israel to kind of awaken the Shekhinah that's there, to awaken the godly potential that's in the land of Israel. So he was in this town for a while. Or written down uh, in that in that place. Again, I'm, I'm, I had I have it on my other phone, but I put my phone over there to, in the other room. I can get the name of it, but I it's a shame. In any case, he was there for a while. And over there he gathered both money. There were wealthy people who supported this. And he gathered a group of young men that were all great, of great caliber, and they were going to join him in his pilgrimage, or not as pilgrimage, he was going there to, to, to in his relocation to, to Israel. Which again, those days was very difficult. Because there was nothing there. There was no way to make a livelihood, to earn a livelihood, and there was no established community. It was literally the pioneers that would have to pave the way. Um, he wanted to go to the land of Israel already in the year 1740. That was when he was ready to embark. But he was held back for a while because there was a big plague that broke out. News came that the Jewish community, the little Jewish communities then that were in Jerusalem were suffering from some kind of a plague and people were dying and not only that, that they didn't allow people to travel. It was like a lockdown. Familiar with that. They didn't allow much travel because they didn't want the the uh, the things to... Uh... In any case, it was delayed for a while, but at the end, him and a group of... Now, what he did was, as I mentioned, he sent letters to Jews in all, in all various different countries asking the Jewish communities to come up with him. Now, he was calling for a mass aliyah. To the land of, and it was all with the interest in hastening the redemption. That's how strongly the redemption was burning in his soul. He felt it. Again, if you are a soul of Mashiach, that's your business. The Arizal writes in, in Sefer Halakutim in Yeshayo, in Sefer Halakutim is in, in Yeshayo chapter 38, the Arizal says, and in every generation, Hashem sends down a soul that's a nitzutz of Mashiach. And if the generation is worthy, then that soul is the Redeemer. And um, if not, that, and also that soul has to teach his Torah, if everybody tzaddikim. And if not, he brings people back to tshuva. And also that person suffers the pain of the, of the Jewish people. And takes, because that's one of the things Mashiach does, is Mashiach suffers for the world. Um, the Arachim finally, with a group of 30 people, set sail from, from this town, from the city, in, in well, it's a port city in, in, in Italy. He left there and he, they, they, they made it, they went to Alexandria. And from Alexandria, they set sail and they were supposed to come to Jaffa, which is next to the Tel Aviv port. From there, it would be a which they were right, wanted to do. However, the captain, the ship captain, decided to drop them off in Akko, which is far, far, I mean, quite a bit far. They were begging and pleading and pleading that he shouldn't, shouldn't leave them in Akko because they, the road from Akko to Jerusalem was much farther and very dangerous because there were... They were highwaymen. They were they were bandits on the road. They would rob people. Sometimes they killed them. It wasn't a safe place. So they were begging the guy, but he didn't care. For whatever reason, uh, you know, he, he got the monies already and he just dumped them. <coughs> Again, they found out when they landed, or, or after a couple of weeks that they were there in Akko, they found out that it was Gamzul Latova. It was for the good. Because again, there was a there was a disease or an outbreak of something that happened in Jerusalem again, 
and many Jerusalemites passed away. Had they been there at that time, it would have, God forbid, they could have been hurt. So it was by divine providence that it was. So he started his yeshiva in Akko. They were happy at least that they were in the land of Israel. Then um, in the year 17, so this was in the year 1740, 1741 that he arrived in Akko. In the early time of 1742, he made his way up to 1742, at the end of 1742, not exactly sure the dates, he, he came to Jerusalem. And he started a yeshiva in the old city of Jerusalem called um, Medrash Knesses Yisrael, the Medrash of the Ensemble of Israel. Knesses Yisrael also stands for the Shekhinah because his intention was to raise the Shekhinah up from the floor. As we know, during the time of exile, the Shekhinah, which is the divine presence within the world, is lying down on the floor. She's hurt. She's broken. So, and the, the actual base, I think there was, a, 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 there were actually two shuls, two, a, two study halls. One was for the revealed part of the Torah, and one was for mysticism. One of them was called Hechal Ahava, the chamber of love which was all about to reveal the deep love that there exists between God and Israel and to bring back the romance, so to speak, to evoke, to spark the love that exists. And the Arachim writes how the study of Torah that was happening in those, in that time that they were now, the Arachim opened his yeshiva in Jerusalem and he passed away less than a year later. So it wasn't really long. He managed to come to Israel. He was there for three years. He passed away. He passed away when he was 46 years old. As we said before, in 1743, yeshiva only opened up. Uh, obviously, there were giants that were studying over there. One of the students is the famous Chida, the great and saintly Chida, a great Sephardic, or uh, what was his name? Um, uh, David something, um, Azulai. who is the uh, Chida, was a student, was a student of, was a student of the Arachayim, in the yeshiva there. In which he studied there, in which he studied there for, for that period of time. So the Arachayim writes a letter about, like, what type of learning they would manage to learn. In other words, the learning over there was on levels way beyond, because these were tzaddikim, and they were able to tap into the incredible potent potential that there was in the land of Israel on the purest and highest levels so again as mentioned earlier it was it was kind of during this passage of time it was kind of during this time that the that the Balshemtov that the holy Balshemtov wanted to meet Arachayim now just to show you just to show how, you know, how connected the Arachayim was to the Shekhinah. That was his entire being. He had love for God and love for the Shekhinah. To, was that um, someone once came to him and asked him for a letter. He was, one of his students asked him for a letter that he's going to Jerusalem. It seems like maybe this might have been when the Arachayim was still living in Akko. And he had his yeshiva in Akko. One of the students was going, one of the people was going up to Jerusalem. And he asked him for a letter of recommendation because he needed, I think, to collect funds or to get some assistance. I mean, in Jerusalem, no one was really had money over there to give anything. But, you know, at least they should treat him nicely and give him some something to eat, you know, take care of him. So uh, he, he, the Archaim said to him, I don't have any acquaintances in Yerushalayim. I don't know anybody. But he said, the only one that I do know is the Shekhinah. She's my acquaintance. So when you go to Jerusalem, go to the Kotel, to the Western Wall, and take this letter that I'm writing to you and stick it in between the rocks. That's where we all, we, you know, we all put letters in the Kotel, you stick it in. The Arachim said, 
And this is what this guy did. Basically, the Rechaim wrote to the Shechina, take care of him. He's a good man. And obviously, you know, Parnassah, livelihood, whatever he needed was uh, came about. So this is the Rechaim. His soul was weeping and crying for the pain of the, of the Jewish people, the pain of the Shechina. He wanted the Giyula. He wanted Mashiach. He wanted the redemption. With all his heart, with all his soul. And as I mentioned earlier, the Balshem Tov was so eager to meet with the Arachayim. According to one of the stories, Reb Gershon of Kitov, the Balshem Tov's brother-in-law, who was the Balshem Tov's man in Israel, um, when he came to visit the Arachayim, um, the I think he was studying Torah with his students in some cave. And um, they, they, he, he, they, there was a guard there. And the guard said, who are you? And he, and he didn't want to let him in. And he said that I'm coming from the Baal Shem Tov. So, he, so the Rechaim said immediately, you know, let him in, let him in. And when he mentioned the Baal Shem Tov to him, he said, oh, he said, he is great. The Rechaim said, he's great. He said, very gadol. He said, he's very great. But when he said the word gadol, he was saying it's very long. Meaning to imply that he's high, high, high. But anyways, the Reb Gershon uh, uh, related to the Arachayim that the Baal Shem Tov wants to come and see him. So the Arachayim said to the to Reb Gershon, find out from the Holy Baal Shem Tov, when he sees me in the upper worlds, does he see my entire body? Does he see me completely? Or is there a part of me that he doesn't see? So the inquiry went back and forth, and finally the answer came. The Baal Shem Tov says, I see him, but I don't see his legs. I don't see his heels. I see him like from his heels and up, but not his heels. When the Arachayim heard that, the Arachayim said, then, he, then, it's, then it's a waste of time for him to come see me. He won't, he won't be able to meet me. The Baal Shem Tov once said that every time they go, he, he goes up to the upper worlds, Wherever level he goes, the Arachayim is there. But then the Arachayim leaves and he jumps up to a higher place. So, the, so they asked the Balshem that means he's greater than you? He said, no, he's just, he's a little quicker. Ruach. And one of the explanations I saw is that Ruach, Balshem is nefesh, and he's Ruach, and Ruach is, is, is fast. In any case, there's another story told that one time it was Shabbos, this would be a way, a way to figure this out was to see if Tezvav Tamuz, which is tonight again, that's what we're talking about, the Arachayim, was your site is 280 years ago. If in the year Tafkov Gimel, um, the um, Tezvav Tamuz, the 15th day of Tamuz, came out on Shabbos. But the story is told that the Baal Shem Tov, um, was washing for the third meal. And while he was washing to the third meal, he gave out a sigh. And he said, it has extinguished, it has been extinguished, Ner Hamaravi. The Western lamp was extinguished. And after Shabbos, the Baal Shem Tov rent his garment, uh, Kriya. He tore his garment like you do on the morning. And basically, they asked the Baal Shem Tov, like, oh, so. And they found out it was Archaim that passed away, and the Baal Shem Tov knew about it. Um, some people argued that you're not supposed to tear Kriya unless you're physically there, unless you're family. And, and the Baal Shem Tov, why was he tear, tear Kriya? The Baal Shem Tov said, I was there by his past. But the other version of the story is that the Baal Shem Tov said that there's a certain secret, a Kabbalistic uh, a permutation, meditation to have in mind associated with the Tilas Yadayim, with washing of the hands. And this secret is only revealed to the to the to one person in the generation. All my life, I was trying to figure out and get that information, and I wasn't able because it was already revealed to the Reb Chaim Ben Atar, Ibn Atar, the Orachaim. So I was not able to get it. Now that they revealed it to me, when I took picked my hands up from the Tilas Yadayim, I suddenly was shown this secret that I've been looking for all my life. I figured that the Orachaim is not in this world anymore, and the secret was passed on. It's really, really interesting. So what I wanted to share today is a couple of teachings 
from the Arachayim on Mashiach, because being that his soul and his entire being is Mashiach, for Mashiach, so we tap his holy soul and learn some of his teachings regarding the Giyula. I just want to finish with, uh, before we, we read the story, another interesting story that I saw, that uh, t- t- there's two interesting stories. One is in the Arachayim wrote, now, by the way, the Balshemto, this is interesting, which is something I didn't know till today. The Arachayim is a pirush that was written, again, the Arachayim passed away 280 years ago, so we're talking about a sage of 300 years ago about, right? And most of the other commentators that are printed in the Makras Gedalus, Makras Gedalus is the most common, the most known Chumash with many commentary. Many Chumashim only have Rashi, right? And the Makras Gedalus is a Chumash. I don't know who was the first one to put it together, but it has the commentary of Rashi and Achmanides, Ramban and Sephardu and Raj, Rajbam and the Targum Yonas and Ben Uziel and, and various different things. Rabbi Nubachaya, some of them. Um, now, uh, the one that kind of is much later than all of these, there are two actually, is the Kliyakar, or the Kliyakar was at least a hundred or maybe, uh, I think a hundred years before the Arachayim. But the Arachayim is the last one who made it into the, into the, into the Chumash, into the Makros Gedolus. So in other words, he's side by side with people who wrote their commentaries like five, six hundred years before him. So why, and there's so many other commentaries, why was it the Arachayim that was, that was chosen to be in the Chumash? So according to what I understand is that the Balshem Tov was the one who highly praised the Purush of Arachayim to his students, and he told them to learn it. And his students were very into publishing the Arachayim, so it became a book that was being studied a lot in Eastern Europe, and for that reason, they printed it in the Chumash. So the Balshem Tov is probably most responsible for the Arachayim HaKadosh's writings to be so, so public and so studied. Because if you make it into the Chumash, you're studied much more. It's all about, we all know, it's all about, you know, it's all about uh, exposure. It's all about where you have your ad. Right, if you're on the front page of the newspaper, you get read a lot. If you're not there, or Google, you know, it's, it's the first couple that come up when you search on the on the search engine. So that you know, there are certain sadikim and scholars that have mazel, so to speak. And obviously, it's because God wanted it this way. So the Rachayim is pir- is pirish is on the chumash. So um, there was a a a printer in the city of Shklov who was not Hasidic. And the city of Shklov in general was a very non-Hasidic uh, community, a very anti-Hasidic community. And uh, he once came across that in Parshas Re'eh, in Arachayim, in the Parsha of Re'eh, in Deuteronomy and Re'eh, I don't, I, I, I don't know which Pasuk, I have to look it up. There is a statement from Arachayim where he says something about Mashiach Hashem, the, the anointed of God, Ushmai Chaim, and his name is Chaim. Where the Arachayim is hinting to that he is Mashiach Saul. This guy, so, so again, the fight against the identification of Mashiach as a certain tzaddik is not a problem that started in the, in, 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 with the Lubavitch Rebbe, with the, with, the, with, the, with the situation. Whenever there are tzaddikim that are sparks of Mashiach, there are those who don't like that they're identified as Mashiach, because the identification of these tzaddikim as Mashiach helped them become revealed. And that's the reason why they hint it. Why do they hint it? Because they wanted the hint to be picked up. So people should rally behind them. It's important. Mashiach needs it. The cheerleader, so to speak, the people that back him up and pump him up. So the Arachayim puts his name and this fellow decided that he omitted it because he felt he was against the fact that the Arachayim was. So he took out that line. He erased that line. So when they brought this book in front of the Holy Ruziner, they brought that Chumash that was printed in Shklov with the omission. It had the Arachayim in it, but it had that line omitted where it says, Rishmai Chaim. So the Holy Rabbi Yisrael of Ruzin said, oh, he said, he omitted, he omitted the Arachayim's name 
from the from the from from the book. Don't worry, so the Arachaim already make sure that he is going to put his name where he belongs. What does that mean? In that Chumash, and maybe the, 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 uh, maybe the Ruziner said where they should look. So in Parshas Naso, there is the Parsha of, of the Sota. So the Sota is the woman that has been unfaithful to her husband. And she engages in a, in, a, in a forbidden relationship, an adulterous relationship. So it says over there that the woman should say, when they read for the woman the, before they give her to drink the water, it says they read, they write out this Megillah, this, 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 um, this a scroll, the Kohen has to write it with God's name, and then they read it to the woman, and she has to accept it, it's a curse. And she has to say, Amen, Amen. So the Pasuk says, the verse says, she says, Amen, Amen, to twice Amen. Rashi says, what is the twice Amen? That she is promising that she didn't have relations with the man, with this particular man that the husband warned her. A woman is only a sight if the, if the husband is suspicious that she was with a particular man. And then he has witnesses that she was alone with him. So, um, but when she's accepting this this oath, she has to say Amen Meish Meish once Amen is on this man, and the other time Amen it's Ish Acher another man. That means she's really saying I'm clean my whole life, and not just from this person, but from anybody else as well. Fine. That's what Rashi says. In the print that this guy printed, it said Amen Meish Zeh Amen. Amen from this man. Amen me'ish. Instead of saying me'ish acher, it said amen me'ish asher. This guy's name was Asher. So basically, this guy had by mistake printed Asher being the other man who had relations with this with this with this with this married woman. So once this was printed, they basically did a little investigation, and it turned out that this guy was engaged in. An adulterous relationship. So basically, if those that usually start up with the tzaddik, usually there's some not the best things behind them. And you got that in this story because it's, it, it, that happened with the Rujina. Another very fascinating story that I read, which is a recent story. I saw Reb Shmuel, Shmuel Eliyahu, who's the rabbi of Tzvat, and he's, uh, right? So he gave a whole shear on the Arachayim. Many of the things that I'm quoting to you is from his talk. I saw it online. Uh, from his talk about the Arachayim and the connection of the Arachayim and Mashiach. So um, in, because today I, when I thought about the Arachayim, I said, let, let, me, let me teach the Arachayim and Mashiach. I want to go through the books of Arachayim and find where the Arachayim talks about Mashiach. So what do you do in order to find? So I Googled it. Uh, Arachayim and Mashiach. And this is the first thing that came up was the shear from Rav Shmuel Eliyahu, which he gave a couple of years ago. And the good thing was I didn't have to listen to it because he had a transcript of it on the bottom, so I was able to read it. And he brings a story of his own father. He's a son of Rabbi Mordechai Eliyahu. He tells a very fascinating story. There was a rabbi who came to his father, Rabbi Mordechai Eliyahu, who was the chief rabbi of Israel, the Sephardic chief rabbi. And L'chaim again. Keep on forgetting what's the coffee and what's the uh, L'chaim. So the the um, the um, yeah. So a, a rabbi came to his father, Rabbi Mordechai and he wanted Rabbi, Rabbi Liao to give a haskama. Haskama means a a validation, a, a recommendation to his sefer. This person wrote a pirush on the Chumash, wrote a commentary on Chumash. And he wanted to ask, you know, what you do is when you, when you make, when you write a book, you're looking for people to recommend it. Like you have in the back of books, you have, you know, a New York Times bestseller or so on. And the New York Times writes about this book and so on. And so in, in, in Jewish books as well, in Torah books, you have usually from rabbis who recommend, who go over the book and say, this is worth reading or this is valid, valid Torah, so to speak. So um, he came to Ramor Chaleo, asked him for a pirush. Ramor Chaleo opens the book, and he sees 
that he wrote over there, and one of and one of right right when he opened the book, he comes he comes to a power. The guy writes that the Pirish, that the Orachayim, who wrote something on this verse, Nelam Imenu, it was hidden from him. He somehow missed an open passage of the Talmud. This is what he writes. Again, this is someone of today who's writing today, and he's he's he sees the Orachayim giving a certain commentary, and it seems inconsistent with a passage in the Talmud. So this guy writes that the, it seems like the Orachayim missed the Orachayim, the Holy Orachayim missed a, a, a passage of the Talmud. So, um, an open pat now. That's, so when Amor Chalio saw that, Amor Chalio got up. He left the Chumash open where, it, where this guy was writing it. And he got up No, no, no. This is what happened. The Urach, so the 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 the, the Rebbe Chaliyah went and took out a chumash, and he looked up that Orachayim, opened up to that page of the Orachayim, and then he got up to go get that passage of the get get a, a, a Gemara to verify that that passage of the Talmud. So as he went, there was a fan in the room, and the fan when the, when when he came back, when the when the uh, Rav Mordechai Eliyahu came back with the Gemara, the fan had moved some of the pages. And it, it literally moved the pages, like, uh, I don't know how many pages, 15, 20 pages forward or back. Like, it happens many times if you have a fan blowing in books. Uh, and there, and Rav Mordechai Eliyahu takes a look, and he sees, over there, the Arachayim quotes this Gemara. This guy says that the Arachayim missed the Gemara. And, and the fan comes and uh, so the Aracha, so so this the, the Ramona Khalil took it as a sign that this author he wasn't happy with him and he told him goes I'm not giving a I'm not giving you an Oscar. You're, 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 you're starting up with the with the um with the with the Arachayim and saying, you know, uh, you know, you, you know you, I'm not giving you my recommendation. And this guy was a he, he wasn't a bad person, he was he was a big scholar and he was taken aback and he was he was upset. So he went back to his other rabbi. I forgot the name. They even mentioned who the other Rav was. And he goes back to me and says, please, please um, send, talk to Reb Mordechai Liao that he should uh, forgive me and he should give me the end. So he says, listen here. He says, I will not be able to change Reb Mordechai Liao's mind. But the one person that would have influence on Reb Mordechai Liao is the Baba Sali. So if you go to the Baba Sali and, and, and if the Baba Sali tells Ramor Eliyahu to do something, Ramor Echel does. As soon as this person walks into the Baba Sali, the Baba doesn't say a word to him. The Baba Sali looks up and the Baba Sali says, Psh. the Baba Sali says, you know, this is how you write on the Orachayim? This is what you write on the Orachayim? The Orachayim, you know, that, that, that he doesn't, uh, doesn't this. Go away, he says, go away. So he was down but our, our Baba Sali could be pretty sharp. So he turned to, her, to the Baba Sali and he said, where should I go? Where should I go? And the Baba Sali said, go to his caver, which he understood to mean that he should go to the, he should go to the grave site of the Orachayim. So he went there one, one evening and he stayed there all night and he was crying and begging for forgiveness from the Orachayim that he wrote that the Orachayim missed the passage of the Talmud. He was crying. Here is the weird story. Again, Reb Shmuel Elio said the story. This is not, the son of Reb Mordechai said the story, so therefore I believe it because it's not coming from him. Somehow in the middle of the night, he hears a sound. He hears talking. He hears a voice coming from the caver. And he says, Machalach, you're forgiven. So the Arachayim, had spoken to him. He was. He didn't know if he's dreaming or not. But he sp spoke back and he said, "So tell me, who's right, me or Chacham Mordechai, the Mordechai Leal?" And the voice answered him, "Chacham Mordechai is right, and you should go and kiss him on the lips." That's what he said. Go kiss him on the mouth. That's what he said. So he left the Erechaim, traveled. The caver traveled to, to, to the to the rabbi, 
And he came there and he was he was all red eyed and it was early morning. And he tells the Aracha, he tells that the Arachaim HaKadosh sent me to you and said, You're right. And he said, I should kiss you. <laughs> and the Arachaim and the Mordechai said to him, And no one is going to believe you that the Arachaim spoke to you. This is what he said. He had given him, he had made him a coffee. This is what happened. He saw he's tired. He could work in the morning. So it was very early in the morning. And he, it was six in the a.m. And Ramor de was in the middle of learning. He knocked, he just he came early, early morning. And he made him a coffee. And the, 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 when he told him this, he said, No one is going to believe you that the Arachim. Basically, he laughed him off. You're crazy. And the Arachim spoke to you. So this guy was so upset that he didn't drink his coffee. And he was upset. He said, like, What am I going to do now? No one is going to believe He decided to go back to the Papa Sali. So he comes back to the Baba Sali and he walks into the Baba Sali. The Baba Sali says, go eat breakfast. He says, go eat breakfast. So he says, but I didn't daven yet. This is still before davening. I didn't daven shachras yet. I'm not supposed to eat before shachras. He says, a person who the Arachim speaks to, this is what the Baba Sali says, a person that the Arachim speaks to is a lot of eat before you can eat now, before davening. You're ready for breakfast. You're okay. So he said, but the Chacham Mordechai didn't believe me. He says, can, can, and he asked him, please, can you tell him? Can you verify? So Reb Shmuel Eliyahu says that when his father went, the thing that Baba Sali told him, that the Arachayim told this person um, that he was Michael him and that, that he forgave him. and, and that the, 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 So, by the way, this, this, this raises the notches for me for Reb Mordechai Eliyahu. We know that the Rebbe was very deeply connected to Reb Mordechai and the Rebbe like shared with Reb Mordechai the deepest things about Mashiach and so on and so forth. Um, so you see that Reb Mordechai I, I thought he was a scholar or whatever, but I, 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 I never had that kind of reverence. But you know, the Rechaim is saying that he's right, and you should <laughs> kiss him on the. <laughs> this, this is serious. That's the story. In any case, this was all just a little history regarding who we're dealing with. And I'll share with you just a few teachings from the Arachayim on Mashiach. What did I do? I took out all the five books of Chumash and I started leafing through. So thank God I'm, I, I, <coughs> I don't know if I have a big spark of Mashiach or a tiny little spark, but a very, very small, tiny little crumb of a crumb. But the one thing that I, 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 I'm always um, involved with is in Mashiach Torah. So I know which parts of the Torah are the Mashiach, where you're going to find jewels on Mashiach, right? So the first place I looked, right, it was right in the beginning, when it says, Vayomer lakim yihi or, let there be light. So I knew that Vayomer lakim yihi or, that could be a place where Mashiach would be mentioned in the Orachayim. Someone who's a Mashiach soul, with that, and I was right. Here is, a, here, here is the teaching of the, of, of the Orachayim, which is very special. And what I loved about it was, we know that Hasidus turned the whole world upside down. Hasidus, told the, Hasid, told, told the Baal Shem told the main, the main outlook of life was to reach heaven. Everything was about heaven, the spiritual. Those that were here Thursday night, were learning how uh, the, the whole idea of a well, of a spring, is that uh, it all comes from below. The ultimate messianic energy doesn't come from heaven, it comes from earth. The, the biggest chidush is coming from earth. And today we had a whole conference, me and a couple of uh, other uh, rabbis. So we, we meet every Monday. We discuss what to do to help hasten the redemption. That's what we should all be doing. So we have a, we have a group. So today we were talking about AI a lot. And about that. And basically we're discussing how the, 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 the infinite knowledge is going to come from machines. It's going to come from earth. It's going to come from below. It's Google just announced today that, the, that they are releasing quantum computer, which means that, uh, just to give you an idea, just to give you an idea, what the fastest computer that is today in operation, imagine, you know, we don't know, our computers are nothing. There are computers, the fastest computer that there is in, in, <clears throat> in tool now would take 43 or 47 years to compute. 
is done in a second once quantum computing is released. So do you understand the advances of what's going to happen, where we are standing right now in terms of the cusp of explosion of capabilities? Once this is introduced into the market and introduced into and coupled with AI, we're talking about crazy, crazy expansion. It's all coming from Earth, coming from below, coming. And anyways, so the 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 understanding of life, of of where God is and where God's interest is, has been generally traditionally in Judaism the afterlife, soul life. Hasidus came along because Hasidus is Mashiach's light and revealed to us that it's really all about the physical. And God desires the physical earth more than he desires that. The famous teaching of the Alter Rebbe in Tanya that he explains how Mashiach is Dira B'Tachtonin, the dwelling place of God in the lower world. In the body, physical. So it was so, now it's a Midrash already, but no one really paid attention to the Midrash. What I loved is that since the Arachayim is a Mashiach Neshama coinciding with the onset of Hasidus, he says it right over here in the first Pasuk. He says on the Pasuk, In the beginning when God created heaven and earth. So he reads it as follows. First God created heaven. And heaven is good. But the creation is only getting better and better. After God created a heaven, God created something so much more spectacular, he says, earth. He's flipping it over. Again, this is, this is a novel way of looking at it. It's the opposite is always understood. God created heaven. Heaven is fantastic. And then earth and earth. Arachim says no. B'reish is in the beginning. God made heaven with all the spiritual worlds. But that's not where God's heart and soul is. Better and even the words of the Arachayim is. Um, that is more precious to him. That is even greater, of greater significance. And that's the earth. The heavens are dependent on earth. In other words, earth controls heaven. What we do down here controls the heavens above. Earlier he brings, he brings that we find that Dover Yedua is known. That Hashem chose to dwell in the darkness, which is weird. He wants to dwell in our physical bodies down here below. We also find, he brings, that God swore, made an oath, so it says in Masechtas Tainas, that he will not enter the heavenly Jerusalem before he enters the, the physical the Jerusalem down here below. That's why the UN and all these choleres and all these guys are so worried that Jerusalem, because they're, they don't want Hashem in this world. Right? That's what we discussed this many times earlier. God is not going to go into the heavenly Jerusalem until he will enter into the earthly Jerusalem, which is down here below. Arezia Magid is teaches you that Hashem it's more precious the physical, more than the spiritual. So therefore he says that's the meaning. The even more than heaven, it's we're moving higher. And then he created earth. And then what does the Pasik do? The Pasik gives a big sigh. The verse gives a big sigh. The Aretz, but earth, but earth became desolate, which means the Shekhinah, who was really dwelling on earth, was chased away from earth. That's the meaning the earth was desolate and empty, right? In the beginning of the Torah. And he says, when is the earth desolate? During the time of exile. Exile is a time when earth does not have the divine, the revealed manifestation of the Shekhinah of God. So he says the word Toyu Vavayu is a sign for the time of exile. Why? Number one, Toyu Vavoyu together is Gematria 430. And that is indicating the 430 years of the exile of Egypt. Now, everybody that learns Chumash knows that the exile of Egypt was only 210 years. But God told Abraham, Avram, that it's going to be for 400 years. 
And when we, uh, there is a verse in Parshas Bo that says that the Jewish people lived in the land of Egypt for 430 years. So the Mepharshim say it starts when Yitzchak was born. You count. And actually, the, that's 400. But you count 30 years is from the, when Hashem made the Brisbane of Sarim, when Hashem made the covenant with Avram, I mean, that's another 30 years. It's from when God told Avram, that's 430 years. So those 430 years, Gematria Tohu Vavohu. Tohu is Gematria 411. And Vav Vohu is Gematria 19. 19 plus 411, 430. So that's indicating the time of the exile of Egypt that the world was desolate. God is not, God is not, is not manifest in an open way in the world. The wicked are powerful. They subjugated, subjugated Israel, the Jewish people. There was darkness in the world. Then he continues. The word of Vavohu, the second word, now we're using the second word, Vavohu, which means empty and desolate, is also referring to the second exile. The exile, the Babylonian exile. Why? Because the Babylonian exile, there's a verse that he brings in which it says that God, when he took us to Babylonia, he emptied us out like an empty vessel. The passage that he brings is, It's a passage in Yermio, um, that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babel, made us sad. He has set us up like an empty vessel. He robbed us of everything. So the emptiness, that's a uvohu. So that's an indi indication to the second exile. The exile. Then, here's the painful one. The, what does the verse continue? V'choshech al to home. And darkness over the deep waters. It's describing the world before God said, let there be light. So what is the darkness according to the Holy Arachayim? What's the darkness on the face of the deep waters? So he says the deep waters is referring to an exile that's never ending. It's incomparably longer than the other. They're called deep waters, just like the ocean has no end. Or the waters are beneath the earth. It's on and goes and on. As he says, he's talking sadly, 1,671 years. Veloy died, but it's not just, that's, that's to home. To home means it's, it's like an endless water. It's an endless darkness. But in addition to that, not only is it that it's, that, that we're, that it's so long, but it's also so dark. And he describes the darkness. You see a person who's painting the pain of the exile. And he says the darkness, Veloy die, Oirech HaGolos, Elochoyshech. It's also dark. And the darkness is indicative of two things. One is, the terrible inflictions that we're having from the nations and the taxation. And again, we're talking about not regular taxes. We're talking about taxations that they tax the Jewish people in particular, the Jewish residents. So much so that it's making the people black from poverty. That's what he's saying. Darkened from hunger and from poverty because they can't pay these, these enormous, these enormous uh, taxes. Ashrei Mishala, fortunate of those who never saw such suffer, who didn't see this. And it's interesting. The Rechaim insists, because he lived in the Western countries, that the Jews under the Muslims suffered more than the Jews under the Christians. It's hard to. But that's what he says. Ubefrat b'mayrev, especially in the West, Shalonu, in our Western countries, which he's referring to the West of Israel, which was Vasheni, that's one darkness. And the second day, it's a is the evil inclination that is wreaking havoc on the Jewish people during the time of exile. Which he describes that there is a lot of Lush and Hara, there's a lot of there's a lot of spiritual darkness that's affecting. So but here here the beautiful Arachayim. He says, a person shouldn't say, but I say call when he sees such a descent of Israel. When he sees Israel in such that is being so long in exile, that God forbid the hope has been lost from the children, it's not so. God said, let there be light. So according to Arachim, what's the light? This is the light of the, of the upcoming redemption. A mufla that is so wondrous. We're talking about a light that that that, that, that 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 no light ever compared to this light that is about to come. But 
if it's such a bright light, how come it's so hidden? So what does the verse say? Let there be light. And what does the next word say? There was light. So the Arachim says the second meaning of the words there was light. He says means that the light is hidden. What does hidden have to do with light? Because the Zohar says, he brings from the Zohar that the word or, the numeric value, gematria of the word or is 207. Aleph of Reish, 27. Same gematria as the word Ruz, which Ruz means a secret. That means that what does Hashem do? Hashem took that light, which is the light of the redemption, and he hid it in a word that it's always eluding us. It's always hiding. You know, we don't even have a date. We don't even know when. What, where, and when. We're wobbling in the darkness. Al derech omrim b'tekunia, as he says, hakavana shagazer Hashem yisale shemoy that Hashem decreed shoyer zeh shemelach hamashiach that this light of King Mashiach lo yisgalu ba'olam should not be revealed in the world, which probably means what do you mean? Of course, because it's not the time of the redemption. What I think he means is since there is a Mashiach in every generation then Mashiach's light should shine in every generation. Hashem makes that the Mashiach, with all his light, the people just don't see it. People miss it. People walk oilam goilam as if they, you know, you can have the brightest light, you can have the sun shining in front of you. Like the Rebbe once said by Yifabrengen, when the Rebbe spoke about Mashiach, the Rebbe says, you're standing and you're looking at the biggest treasure that all the generations were looking at, and you're not seeing, he said. That's what the Rebbe said. If I beg, you're looking over here, and you're looking over here, and you're not seeing. That's what the Rebbe expressed himself. One of the things. Basically, the way I understand the Rebbe was saying, hello, anybody? <laughs> it should not be revealed in the world. The Yisod Tomun Etzla, it should be concealed. And like he brings from the Zohar, where God says himself, hear these words, Lelibi Galisi, I revealed the redemption to my own heart. In God's heart, it's revealed. From my heart to my mouth, it's not being revealed. And Hashem has the secret of the redemption hidden in his heart, and it doesn't come to his mouth. However, God saw that the light is good. The light of Mashiach. What does that mean? That it's all worth it. The light of the Geula is so great that whatever it takes to get to it. Ashrei Ayin. Fortunate is the eye that saw that light. Also, Hashem saw that hiding it, or which means secret, is also good, he says. Because for, for reasons known that are known, he says, it has to be hidden. It has to be hidden. And then the verse continues, and the Spirit of God is hovering over the water. So then he brings what it says in the Midrash that that's referring to the spirit of Melech HaMashiach. What does it mean it's hovering over the water? Water is Torah. So he explains that means that the Jewish people will be redeemed only with the merit of Torah, which is compared to water. In other words, there needs to be Torah spread over the world, like we're doing tonight. We're learning Torah, we're learning the Arachayim's Torah. So this is the water that will bring the Giyot. Anyways, it's very special. He continues on. I don't want to go through the whole thing. He explains how God separated between light and day. I'll give you this little synopsis of the next part. And then I want to teach you one or two more teachings of the Arachim regarding Mashiach. So this was one right in the beginning of the Torah. But I want to just continue how he continues. How he continues this little passage about light. So light is talking about Messianic light. Earlier it's talking about the exiles. And the, the light is Mashiach. And it's hidden. But then he says... What does the next verse say? The next verse says that God had to separate between the light and the darkness. And then God calls the light. God calls light day. And to, and to night he calls he called night. It was evening, it was morning, it was one day. Here's the beautiful interpretation from the Arachai. He says like this. Until Mashiach comes, there is a certain mixture between holy and the unholy. Things get mixed. And what happens? We know, he says, there are sparks of holiness that are embedded in the darkness. And that's where they get the darkness, the forces of unholy get all their power. Because all power comes from Kedusha. When there are sparks of holiness trapped in the other side, that's what gives them power. On the other hand, he says, there are pieces of klipa 
that have been mixed into the realm of the holy. And that where that he says is the concept of Erev Rav. What's Erev Rav? People that are not supposed to be amongst the Jewish people that got mixed into the Jewish people. So there is like a, 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 a mixture, holy, holy sparks. There is a confusion. Now, as long as it's mixed, you can't praise the light because the light is not sparkling. The side of holiness can't be praised. But as a process of the entire world history in which we do the separation, as we know through Torah and mitzvahs, we separate, we're separating the sparks of holiness that are in the klippa are coming out. And therefore they're letting the klippa remain pure klippa, pure unholy. And the, good, and, the, and, the, and the negative that has got etched into holiness also becomes exposed, gets, gets pulled out. And things become very clear in the world. Who is what? What's holy? What's unholy? And the two separate. Once they're separated, that's the meaning of ayav de lalokim, that God separates through thousands of years of purification, it gets separated. Then, how we, look how he translates the words, vayikra elokim laoryom. Vayikra comes from the word yikar. Yikar means preciousness, splendor. He doesn't read vayikra that God called. Vayikra, God gave honor and splendor to the day. When? After this the, the realms of holiness have become purged from the unholy crumbs that have gone into it. And after these sediments have left it, then in the future, Kedusha will be praised to its fullest. It will be in a state of Vayikra, Vayikar. It will be in its full splendor. However, watch this. Ula Choshech, Karolayla, simply it means, and to darkness he called light. Here he changes the word kara. Kara over here doesn't, it doesn't mean cold. It also doesn't mean splendor. God is not giving splendor to the darkness. Over here, the word kara comes from the word mikre. What does mikre mean? Mikre means something that is very um, by chance, something that is very temporary, something that is a, a fluke, a fluke, something that's like a, uh, 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 a a unintentional incur occurrence you call a mikra something that just just happened it's like an accident it's like uh so this is what he's saying ula and to darkness mikra without much attention without lila hashem designates that only for the period of time which is called lila which is the time of exile so the time of exile the unholiness can exist with a very, very temporary existence. But once the two are separated, it will, it will end because the night will end. But I love the end of the, the verse, how he translates it. Once that's done, then darkness and night will be gone forever. What then is going to happen? What does that mean? It was evening and it was day. One day means that both evening and day will be one day. What does that mean? Night won't be any more night when Mashiach comes because the moon will be as bright as the sun. That means that there won't be any, which generally means there won't be two sections in life, holy and unholy, dark, evil and goodness. It will only be Erev and Boker, evening and morning will all be Yom Echad, will all be the revelation of Hashem Echad, that God is spiritual and physical mundane and holy, everything will make up one, one oneness of God's truth. That's his pirush on Mashiach right at the beginning of the, of the Chumash. Um, I have like quite a few others, but it's getting late. Um, there's one beautiful one on Parshas Pinchas, this week's Torah portion, where he goes through the history of the tribe of Yehuda, uh, which in Parshas Pinchas it counts it counts all the all the tribes. So one of those, um, w one of the, and I mean again, it names the names. Not it, it names the names of all the tribes, of all the families, of all of all the tribes. Because Hashem tells Moshe to count the Jewish people. He reads the, all the names of the tribe of Yehuda, and he explains their significance of their names as the history of exile and redemption. Very fascinating.
what I'm going to do now, because I don't, I'm not going to go through this because it's too much. We should do a whole, we should do more classes on it. But what he, what he, what he, what, he, what I am going to point out is a few powerful ideas. I'm not going to read it inside, just powerful ideas that he does mention. Number one, he has a whole discussion elsewhere regarding Moshe and Moshiach. And he's the one who gives us clarity that because the Zohar says that Moshiach will be Moshe. And it's hinted to in the words, Moshe, there's a verse that says, What was, that will be. There's a verse, it's in Mishle, I think, or in Kehelas. It says, Basically, this is probably where the concept comes history repeats itself. Mashahaya, that which was, who Shayya, that will be. So the the Arachaim says that that Pasuk, Mashahaya, who Shayya, the Zohar says, is Rasha Tevis. It's the, the, the acronym for that verse spells Moshe. That's to teach us that Moshe the future. So the Arachaim asks the question, how can that be? The Redeemer of the future is going to be from the descendants of King David. Can't be Moshe. So he goes on to explain how Moshe includes all, everybody was included in Moshe. All souls were included in Moshe. And therefore, King David is also included in Moshe. And therefore, the, the, the King David that's in Moshe, that's the element of Moshiach. So what that means is that when Moshiach's neshama that is in Moshe will be the neshama of Moshiach. So it could be that Moshe is Moshiach, meaning the neshama of Moshe Rabbeinu kind of is converged with David HaMelech's neshama, and that's the neshama of Moshiach. Another interesting um, uh, element regarding Moshiach is, oh yeah, in last week's Torah portion, where Bilam predicts that, um, he says, I see him, but not now. I, 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 I see him, but not now. Uh, I'm sorry. I see him, but not now. Ashirena, and I and I and I and I'm and I'm looking out towards it. The low karov and not close. A, a a a a a star will shoot forth from Jacob. The come shave it me Israel, and a leader will will a, a ruling power will rise from Israel. So it's talking about this is the prophecies regarding the redemption that Bilam is seeing already the future greatness of Israel. So the Arachayim says that this is talking about two possibilities of redemption. One is if the Jewish people deserve the redemption based on merits. Based on that, we're going to hasten the redemption at an earlier time. That's what Bilam says. Arenu, I see him, but not now, but also not so far off. Because that could be any time. We could have done it in the last 2,000 years. Had we had the merit, had we had the push, had we have enormous... Um, um, power, we would have done it. And then if it would have been that way, then Mashiach would come like a shining star. That means it would be a totally heavenly, miraculous redemption. It would be just purely miracles. The whole thing would be Mashiach would be coming from the clouds of heaven. It would have been a completely descent from above. That's called Dorach Koychav Meyakov. A star will come down like a star in the sky. However, he says, if God forbid we're not, we're not worthy. And then Moshiach has to come at its set time. What's called Be'ita at its set time. That's what Bilam was referring to when Bilam said, um, I'm looking out, but it's not close. It's far, far, far. Like we're already at 2023 and we're not seeing it yet. Completely. I mean, of course, we, we've seen it already since 1990. We're seeing it. The Rebbe said was there already, and the Mashiach is here already. But, but it was, we're still blocked. We're still blocked. But then, he says, if that's going to happen, then it's going to be the come shave at me, Israel. It's going to be the leader is going to get up, but it's going to be a far more natural process. It's not going to be spectacular. It's not. He, not saying that there won't be, he won't lead us into an amazing time, but the process of the redemption is going to be more, more within, within the natural order. That's another fascinating uh, uh, teaching. And, and wait, and that's why he says, by Darach Kochav, it says, Mi Yaakov. And over here it says, the uh, Shevet, it says, Mi Yisrael, from Israel. We know that the Jewish people have two names, Yaakov and Yisrael. Which one is greater? 
Israel is a much higher name. Yaakov is a lower name. So how come the more spectacular redemption is associated with Yaakov? And the more and the more uh, less spectacular redemption is related to Israel, which is a low, which is a higher name. So he explains, no, it depends. If the redemption comes based on the pe people deserving it, that means that all the Jewish people are going to participate. Then it's going to come Yaakov. Even from the regular Jews, they're going to be kicking in. They're going to be giving the power. But if Mashiach is coming at its ultimate time, then it's going to be only the merit of the tzaddikim. Then it's going to be me Yisrael from Yisrael, which are the higher, but it's only the tzaddikim who are, who are there's lacking merit coming from the Yaakov Jews. It's only coming from the Yisrael Jews. That's a problem. Because it means that it's only the tzaddikim pushing. And like the Rebbe kept on crying to us, I'm not doing it, the Rebbe says. I need you guys to do it. He didn't want it to be Yisrael. He could have done it. But I don't want it to be Yisrael. I want it to be Yaakov. I want it to be everybody. Another interesting, I'm going to leave with this, another very interesting teaching from the Arachim regarding the future is when, when I, by the Brisbane Absar, I'm also in Beresh, it's a fascinating piece. It says over there that God promised Avraham the land of ten nations. But, but Hashem only gave us seven, and then he gave us the other three. So, But the way God says it to Avram is that he first puts the three that he, that he didn't give it to us yet. That's all. The land of the other three are going to be given to us only in Mashiach's times. So the Arachayim asks, if so, then God, when Hashem tells it to Avram, he should have put those three last. He puts those three. If you look in, in Lech Lecha, it says, Keni, Knizi, the Kadmoini. These are the three nations that are going to be added on to the land of Israel only in the days of Mashiach. So why does he put it first, not last? So he answers that even though we got Israel back then, the Israel that we got till now is nothing compared to the Israel, to the quality of Israel that's going to be in the future. That's why Hashem tells Avram, the main Israel is not the Israel they're going to get through Joshua or Yeshua. It's going to be the one that Mashiach Tzedkenu is going to rule with the Jewish people. So that's why the, the, the one that we got was very bidiyevet, very like, you know, well, we have to give something. But, but the world wasn't ready yet for the ultimate land of Israel. So the primary land. And therefore he says, very powerful words, he says. I, I, he says, like, I, 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 this is the answer to those heartbroken souls that have, that, have already, that have already fallen into despair and that they've despaired from the coming of Mashiach. He says, how can you when you know God's promise to Avram has not yet even be fulfilled yet? Not even begun to be fulfilled. What we've gotten is nothing. The promises are still waiting. The main promises to, to Abraham, to Avram Avinu, to promises to, is yet to happen. So how can we not be excited with breathless anticipation waiting for this? All I can say, Darachim has been waiting already for 200 and 300 years. And he predicts the Gaul Mashiach coming in his life, as I said earlier in 1740. That's the time that it has to start. And his predictions were right because the Baal Shem Tov came and started revolutionizing the Jewish people, bringing a whole new energy and a whole new... But if the Rechaim would only, right? Ah, I don't know how he would live with the pain of knowing 300 years later and it was still not... It's still not completed. So hopefully the Rechaim... Um, is going to, I'm sure he's listening to our share because we're learning his teachings and we're celebrating him all the way in the other. If Darachim says that Hashem wants the lower, the lower part of the world, Morocco, Mela, Los Angeles, Hollywood, it's a whole different level. We're learning over here his teachings, talking about his yearning for Mashiach. May our heart's desires connect to the Arachayim's desire for Mashiach. And together, the Yisrael, he is the Yisrael, he's the Tzaddik. We're just a simple Yankalach. May our Yankel Yid, together with the Yisrael, the great Tzaddik, our yearnings merge together with his and blow away the last remnant of the exile and reveal the redemption. And let it be like the Arachim said, Yehi or let the light of Mashiach, and let it stop being a secret. It's been secret long enough. Let it be really revealed. Because Ruach HaLekim and Achefes Al Pnei Amayim over the waters, and when the waters were, were spreading it over the waters, over the whole world through the internet, we're teaching and all these teachings are going out. May we see the redemption. May it be now, now, now. Thank you.